Welcome back, everyone. My name is Christopher Jasper, and this is the Gregorian Chant Academy, where I hope to help you learn how to artfully and prayerfully sing Gregorian chant with understanding so that we can give greater glory to God, sanctify ourselves, and make the world around us a better place. In this episode, we will investigate the most basic elementary elements and units of rhythm as taught by Dom Macro in the Solemn Method. Before we begin, let it be clearly understood that I do not necessarily defend the Solemn Method, yet neither do I condemn it. I'm not a fan or a follower of Dom Macro or Dom Gajard, uh, Dom Jean Clair or Dom Saunier, or any particular person or school of thought. What I am a fan and follower of is the truth, wherever that might be found. So whether you plan on using the Solemn Method or not, this series should at least help you to have a better understanding of it. Gloria in excelsis Deo. According to Dom Macro, the study of rhythm is of such importance that he believes it should be studied before melody, harmony, or any other element of music. And in order to have the clearest understanding of its very nature and how it is applied to Gregorian chant, we need to break it down into its most simple parts. So to begin, all rhythm, whether it be in music, dance, what have you, all rhythm begins in silence and stillness. In this state, there is no measurement of time. So imagine a continuous straight line representing this silent stillness. As soon as a single sound or gesture is made, suddenly this line is broken or divided into two parts, before and after the sound or gesture, and now we have something by which to measure the passing of time. Obviously, for rhythm or music to exist, a single sound is not enough. We need a succession of sounds. But it won't do us any good if one sound is made and the following sound is two hours later. Likewise, it won't do us any good if the sounds are so rapid in succession that it sounds like one continuous sound, because then we could not distinguish them. So we need a succession of sounds which are neither too far apart and neither too close together in order that we may have an intelligent comprehension of time and the music. Therefore, every single individual note or emission of sound will be referred to as a simple beat or, in Dom Macro's terminology, the basic pulse. Some opponents of this solemn method of Makaro will claim that it is a kind of mensuralism in which every note has essentially the same value and it ignores the value of the text. This is simply not true. Dom Makaro and Dom Gajard very clearly explain and demonstrate that they are opposed to singing the chant according to the classical mensuralist principles, and that this basic pulse is based upon the syllable of the Latin text. Let's take a look here in Dom Macaro's book, Le Nombre Musical Gregorien, or The Gregorian Musical Rhythm. There is nothing absolute about the duration of the basic pulse. It depends on the general movement of the phrase and the character of the composition. In modern music, this duration undergoes notable changes, but in Gregorian chant, the sung words help to determine the approximate value of the basic pulse. Here, the basic pulse equals the normal length of a short Latin syllable in metrical language, poetry or prose, and of an ordinary syllable in rhythmical or tonic language. This then leads us to the next very important unique character about Gregorian rhythm, and that is that this basic pulse is indivisible. That is, it cannot be divided and subdivided into smaller and smaller parts. For example, in our contemporary music, a quarter note can be divided into two eighth notes, an eighth note into sixteenths, into thirty seconds, into sixty fourths, and in theory, on and on to infinity. But practically speaking, there comes a point when a note is made so short that the human ear and mind cannot hear it any shorter. Obviously, if every note were this quick, nobody would want to listen to the music. Boethius, writing in the 6th century in his De Institutione Musica, describes both kinds of rhythms. 
those divisible and indivisible. In Gregorian chant, the basic pulse is indivisible. Why? Let's look again. The basic pulse is indivisible. That is to say, its normal duration, once determined, which is that of a Latin syllable, cannot be divided into fractions any more than can the Latin syllable, which serves as its rule and support. This basic pulse can, however, be shortened or reduced slightly, yet without cutting it in half, and it can also be enlarged slightly, yet without doubling its value. If it is doubled, then it is no longer a basic pulse, it is then a composite pulse because it is worth two basic pulses. If a note in Gregorian chant is doubled in value, there are two ways of indicating this in our modern square notation. Either you have two notes right next to each other on the same syllable, or a single note with a dot placed next to it. This dot, called the punctum mora, is a contemporary way of indicating that a note is worth two basic pulses. Dominus dixit ad me. So if we have this succession of basic pulses, what is it then that produces rhythm? Well, we covered this a little bit in our previous episode when we saw how pitch, intensity, duration, while independent of rhythm, nevertheless, any single one or all three can help to produce rhythm, and that the definition of rhythm, according to St. Augustine, is the art of well-ordered movement. But even more precisely, it is the relationship between two opposites, a rise and a fall, tension and relaxation, or according to the Greeks, arsis and thesis, the French terms élan and repos, uniting them all together into one single movement. Because of this, the smallest, most basic unit of rhythm requires and is limited to two or three basic pulses. Why? Well, because a single pulse would not constitute any rhythm, and because numbers exist in evens and odds, anything greater than three is reducible to two or three. Likewise, all forms of rhythm can be reduced to two elementary forms of rhythm, the spondaic and the iambic. The spondaic is a duplex, that is, it is made up of two basic pulses of relatively equal value, with the second pulse having a very slight feeling of rest, a mere touch or support. The iambic is a triplex, made of three basic pulses, and ordered as a short followed by a long. So you have one note worth one basic pulse, and another note worth two basic pulses. And this is the natural rhythm of speech, and helps to demonstrate that in all natural rhythms, brevity belongs to the upbeat and length belongs to the downbeat. The upbeat is naturally energetic, and the downbeat is naturally restful. Both Dom Makaro and Dom Gajard echo the voices of the ancients when they speak of the fact that we possess rhythm in our very own selves, both physical and spiritual, and that our musical rhythm is a kind of exterior projection of our own vital rhythm, and that unless we are able to associate our musical rhythm with our own vital rhythm, there's something lacking. For example, Aristotle, in his work on rhetoric, when speaking of the iambic rhythm, says, quote, The iambic is the form of ordinary discourse, and it is natural to express oneself in iambics. And again, the peon form, which is three shorts and a long, such as the Latin word celeritas, is appropriate for phrase endings, whereas a brief syllable, because of its weakness, gives a mutilated and limping impression to the phrase. Consequently, it is on a long syllable that the phrase must come to rest in order that its ending be felt. And this is not merely because of the will of the writer, nor because of a material graphic sign, but because of the nature of rhythm which demands a conclusion. Perhaps many of you are unaware that St. Augustine wrote six books on music, and specifically on rhythm, 
And this was an incredibly influential work for many centuries, being drawn upon by such other famous and influential writers such as Boethius, Cassiodorus, used in other writings such as the Musica in Kiriadis and the Scolica in Kiriadis, and many others. So I would like to conclude this episode by taking another look at some more of St. Augustine's views on music and rhythm. And while I do have Augustine's six books called De Musica, we will instead be looking at some excerpts from an overview by music professor John McInnes. Music was, of course, an important factor in Augustine's conversion and spiritual formation. Augustine's relationship to music as a liberal art was, in many ways, typical for his day. That is, in late antiquity, music was largely a mathematical art studied in the philosophical context of Neoplatonism. As a side note, for those of you who are unaware, from classical antiquity through the Middle Ages, the liberal arts consisted of seven subjects which were divided into two parts. The lower studies, called the trivium, were made up of grammar, logic, and rhetoric. The higher studies, called the quadrivium, were made of arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. Back to John McInnes. For example, in De Ordine, Augustine presents the liberal arts as preparation for philosophical study and explains how numbers are a means by which the unity and coherence of creation can be discerned with implications for living a well-ordered life. Additionally, it was thought through the study of physical reality, for example, via quantitative liberal arts like music, a soul is trained to reach for the incorporeal. This aphorism is actually a cornerstone of Augustinian aesthetics. Get past the responses of your physical senses to perceive the higher reality. Move beyond the created to the creator. In order to rank their types, Augustine explains how rhythms act in relation to the human soul and physical body. He concludes that both soul and body have their own rhythms. Augustine then explains how the discernment of rhythmic equality and symmetry in music is only one way in which we may identify an order pervasive throughout all creation. For example, the motions of the cosmos demonstrate an appropriate ordering for the soul. The planets move in perfect unity in imitation of eternity, and their rhythms unite earthly things in the hymn of the universe. Additionally, for Augustine, those rhythms we experience in our earthly life may be beautiful, but they should not be valued inordinately. Rather, pleasing, well-crafted rhythms point us toward an inherent love of order, which the soul needs, and serve as another call to embrace reason as opposed to base sensuality. Throughout De Musica Book 6, Augustine refers to the Ambrosian hymn Deus Creator Omnium, his mother's favorite, and this hymn serves as a model for what Augustine intends music to be. That is, there are rhythms at play all along the process of someone recalling and singing the chant to the hearing of it, to the contemplation of it. And for Augustine, the song is so well crafted that a soul easily moves from the beauty of the music received by the senses, to the contemplation of God's transcendent beauty. In our next lesson, we will follow Dom Gajard's illustration of how these elementary basic units of rhythm are joined together to form larger units of rhythm by breaking down a well-known chant into its smallest parts in order to then build it back up again. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up Comment down below, subscribe, and share it with others. Don't forget to check out all of our other lessons here available on this channel. And also, please consider supporting this academy by joining us on Patreon for as little as $2 a month. And as always, sing praises wisely.